Hello and welcome back to Eschatology Matters. I'm your host, Josh Howard. This is the first of a three-part series that I did as a special series examining natural law and two-kingdom theology. This was done with Dr. Nelson Klosterman, and this will be the first installment of three parts. So I hope you enjoy it. Welcome back to Eschatology Matters. Uh, today we're jumping into a three-part uh, discussion on two-kingdom theology and its various iterations. So I'm joined today with uh, Dr. Nelson Klosterman. Uh, Dr. Nelson, thanks for joining me today. You're welcome. Thanks for the invitation and the opportunity. Absolutely. So so you and I have talked about uh, two-kingdom before. Um, mm -hmm. we, we talked about it on a different channel. But I'm just going to ask you, walk us into a little bit about not only what is two-kingdom theology, what, what do we mean by that, um, why would I say there's various iterations of it, and specifically looking toward where we are right now, some of the categories that we want to get into um, include your conception of NL2K. So mm -hmm. that, that's kind of a broad, mm -hmm. broad ask, but just start walking us into that a little bit if you yeah. want. Well, the, the whole concept of two kingdoms uh, goes way back to the time of the early church when the early church had to uh, do business with its uh, living in a culture, in a, in, in a state like Rome, and, and uh, elsewhere, the, uh, the notion of how does the church relate to the state is not a new notion, and the solutions to that question are what gave birth to two-kingdom theology. Now, we have to, we have to trace it back uh, in part to Augustine, who, uh, who wrote about the city of God and the city of man as two competing and opposing, really antithetical kingdoms. And... Uh, uh, loyalties and ways of life and and the like the two kingdoms or the two cities of Augustine then centuries later uh, gave birth to or yielded the views of Luther during the time of the Reformation when he in resolving the question of church and state uh, posited two kingdoms the kingdom of God's right hand and the kingdom of God's left hand and uh, these two kingdoms were distinct in their callings, in their mode of operation, and in their governance. And uh, so the notion of two kingdoms per se is not new, and it's not objectionable uh, as such as it has come down to us through history. But the uh, occasion for current discussion and uh, passion and intensity about this subject involves uh, claims being made today about a, a clearly revisionist understanding of two kingdoms that is a, being identified as the biblical or the reformed or the classic or the historic view of two kingdoms. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I uh, uh, th This modern contemporary iteration, to use that word, um, I have dubbed NL2K because natural law, the NL part, is the uh, is thought to be and said to be the way of governing one of the two kingdoms, and the two K of course stands for two kingdoms. Others use R two K as a as an acronym, radical two kingdoms, because emphasizing that uh, there's a a radical disjunction, disconnection between uh, the one kingdom and the other kingdom. In other words, today's uh, iteration. Uh, deals with and is resting upon clear dualities, dualities like uh, sacred and secular. Those are clearly uh, terms that bespeak or describe two uh, unrelated, uh, disjointed, disconnected uh, areas of life, realms of life, and, and the like. So there's the uh, sacred, the secular, there's the church, and the rest of society, for example. And in the church, the Word of God, special revelation, governs and obtains and, and decides things. Whereas in the rest of society, anything not church, that's to be governed by natural law, by reason, and uh, as we're going to see, by, by common grace. So you have special revelation and general revelation. You have sac uh, secular, which is governed by general revelation, and you have the sacred, which is governed by special revelation. Um, so in summary then, NL2K is a, is a system of ideas. It's a movement. It's a, 
one would say it's an ideology, it's a way of interpreting the Bible, and it's inherently then a system of dualisms. Um, let's distinguish for a moment between a duality and a dualism. Uh, I have a duality of my right and my left hand. Uh, dualism means my right hand never knows what my left hand is doing, and they're not connected at all. They're not unified by my brain, by my neurons, etc. That's a that's a duality which is perfectly acceptable. But a dualism is an absolutizing of each, separating each, and uh, disconnecting and disjoining each uh, from the other. So we have to be careful that a duality does not become a dualism because a duality is integrated, a duality speaks of complementarity, a duality speaks of cooperation and the like. Dualism, however, speaks of separation and speaks of disconnectedness. Uh, in addition to these kinds of uh, dualisms that I've identified, there's also that between common grace and special grace, between a redemptive kingdom, that's the kingdom of Christ, in a non-redemptive kingdom, that's the kingdom of this world, you might say. And uh, this, this is accompanied by any number of dualities or dualisms that uh, continue down the line, like faith against reason. So in one kingdom, faith operates. In the other kingdom, reason is king. And faith has, no speak, has nothing to say, has no speaking terrain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's even a wrong construal then along this line of law and gospel. Law and gospel um, are terms the Reformation bequeathed to us to speak about the uh, two impulses in the Bible, which again are never separated. If you look at the Old Testament law of Moses, it is saturated, it is uh, infiltrated, permeated, we might say, with gospel, with gospel grace. Moreover, the gospel itself makes demands. It makes demands to those who believe, who receive the gospel, it makes demands of holiness, of, of, of uh, obedience, and so forth. So there's a right construal and a wrong construal of law and gospel. Again, a duality versus a dualism. Let, let, let me ask you this. So, so because you, you touched on two things that I think um, I really want to press in on, and that's the redemptive kingdom versus non-redemptive kingdom. I think that's key. Uh, we, we see that come out in a lot of the, especially the contemporary literature on this. So I think that's a key distinction to make or a key theme to walk through. Um, the second thing you're speaking of is the uh, sort of overarching uh, graciousness of God's covenants. The fact that these are redemptive covenants, because again, that's that's kind of a flashpoint in this whole conversation, mm -hmm. specifically with the Noahic covenant. We'll, we'll get there. Um, what are some, how can we kind of qualify this a little bit on the front end as far as, you know, you've mentioned uh, Augustine and Luther, we could throw Calvin in the mix. There, right. There's several figures who speak of two kingdoms, two cities, two realms, two administrations. There, there's lots of two uh, language. So what are we affirming alongside, like if, if we can kind of zoom back and say, let's put all the qualifications on the front end. What is worth worth recognizing as far as these two kingdoms? You've already mentioned several of them. The fact that you have these two things walking hand in hand. Um, but I'm, I'm specifically, I'm thinking toward if, if someone is a proponent of two kingdom theology today, um, everybody's trying to grab hold of Augustine. Everybody wants to claim Calvin's on their side. Sometimes the language isn't quite there. It doesn't seem to really firmly say, no, you, you can claim Augustine in your camp. Um, but what sort what sort of, uh, what sort of common ground might we affirm alongside those, even in the, the, uh, NL2K camp? Like, what, what is some of the common ground which we are affirming beyond what you've already recognized, do you think? Well, I think, I think any dualities that are posited, we can affirm. Okay. For example, the duality of creation and redemption. These are obviously two, uh, moments in, in theology, in history, two realities that need to be brought, and are indeed brought together. Um, so there are many dualities that we can affirm together with those who are defending uh, NL2K today. Uh, that, for example, in, in the world, there are there is room, as there is in the church, frankly, for the use of reason, the use of persuasion, the use of argument, and such things as that. Um, faith is not opposed to these things, but faith seeks to integrate them, and faith seeks to employ them where useful and where helpful. So, 
That's why it's so difficult to get at this this matter and this issue because language is used that is very, very similar. Mm -hmm. But because context is king, it is the use to which those terms are being put right. where, when you finally learn that, hey, we're talking in radical 2K or NL2K, we're talking about two distinct, two separated spheres and realms and and modes and methods etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's where the crossover occurs so again there, we have much common ground in terms of language i think the differences begin to appear when we did, when we analyze how those terms are being used how those how that language is being employed mm -hmm. to what end and and by the way to what end is an important question i think for us to be asking always, namely, what is the payoff of this debate, of this dis discussion and disagreement? Where, if we do disagree genuinely, not just terminologically, but genuinely, where do we see the payoff occur? And, and maybe we can walk back from that payoff to see, oh, that's how we got there, and that's where the differences then emerge and become more clear. One, I think one payoff is clearly the um the responsibility and the calling uh of of christians in society to uh bear witness to and to exert and exercise their witness in uh, areas of culture like education uh, economics labor business uh, art politics and so on i think that payoff is where we clearly clearly differ and come down in different uh, different areas. Okay, so so with the 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 NL two K camp being more removed, like this is not this is not the realm. So what you're describing is because I I fear that what people often hear with this is you either believe in two kingdoms or you believe in some sort of mon mono kingdom yeah. mono you know covenantalism even. Right. Um, you're saying no, there's a whole lot more variance in there. What oh, yeah. we're describing is a view of two kingdoms, which may be fine and proper. You're describing though, and kind of, kind of uh, going against a view that that radically bifurcates those two kingdoms. That's correct. So one of those payoffs then would be the the arts, the sciences, the culture, all of that sort of thing. That's that's essentially not our business because those kingdoms are separated. Well, am not, I hearing you correctly? Not necessarily. I wouldn't say not our business, but it's not where we apply a distinctive Christian method and a Christ, distinctively Christian approach in those areas of culture. That's that's the complaint. So we're still involved in it. So you're you're the citizen standing in two kingdoms. You're right. still involved in it, but not as a Christian because that's not the same kingdom. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. So this this is where we get the language of, for example, um, the, the a Christian acting as such, or a Christian acting, uh, or the church acting as such in name, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, what are some of the other what are some of the other payoffs you're identifying here? Because that might that might help to see like where is this what is this leading to? What are the what are the the payoffs as you've described them and well, the tracing backward? Here's here's a payoff that one ought to consider. Just think through this one with me a moment. Um, I heard recently uh, an interview with an exponent of uh, of NL2K describe the matter of um, uh, homosexuality and rape why would we it was asked why would we be opposed to that in our culture and in our society today would we oppose that because God opposes that and God declares that to be wrong and sinful and disordered and destructive and so on and the response was no no we would oppose it not because God opposes it we would oppose it because it is inherently violent mm. and it is inherently uh, destructive of human relationships and uh, this is a kind of appeal to natural law where well everybody can see that these behaviors are uh, violence driven and are uh, destructive in outcome my reply is I'm afraid not everybody can see that because we have people today who uh, defend these things and who advocate these things precisely because, well, let's just take homosexual relations and we could expand that perhaps to pedophilia and other kinds of what I would uh, describe as divinely disapproved expressions of sexuality are being today 
uh, approved as forms of love, expressions of love. And if they are expressions of love, who are we then to deny those expressions legitimacy? And, and I would say, uh, in answer, God defines what are proper and improper, what are acceptable and unacceptable expressions of human love in the, in the erotic sphere and so on. So I, I think that's an example. It's interesting with this because, um, not, not to like confuse the, the conversation, but it seems that this would be a very hard fit, especially within reformed camps for anybody with a presuppositional bent or leaning. Mm -hmm. So, so even if you don't go the full, you know, Van Tillian presuppositional route, but even if you just have sort of what I would dub as, as Calvin's view of scripture being the lenses through which we see the, the natural revelation, if, if that's sort of the approach, any sort of, and again, we're not talking about all two kingdoms. We're specifically referring to what we're what you're dubbing NL2K. Any sort of removal of those two kingdoms, you have a different set of spectacles in essence that you're using yeah. over here. You're not seeing the same definition. So it seems that anybody that would be predisposed toward, I think, what would be just a broadly, you know, Calvinist view of of the role of Scripture in divining natural revelation would have a really tough time yeah. with that approach. I, I think that uh, anyone who calls themselves presuppositionalist, anyone who claims to uh, be a presuppositionalist has to, at minimum, agree that presuppositionalism means God defines reality. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't mean that, I don't know what it means to say that I'm a presuppositionalist. I mean, that means a whole lot more than that, right. but it certainly cannot mean less than that. So if it's true, then, that a presuppositionalist is one who believes God defines reality, and if God defines reality, then it seems to me that as Christians we're obligated to follow, adhere, promote, declare, bear witness to God's definitions of reality. And that includes definitions of uh, human beings. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to bear the image of God? Well, there's a presupposition that one bears the image of God, and one is not simply a, an accident of, of, of cells coming together uh, randomly. Uh, what does it mean? And, and I simply cannot understand how someone can bifurcate modes of persuasion, modes of defense, modes of operation, um, and claim to be a presuppositionalist, which means at minimum God defines reality and God's definition of reality ought to obtain. Right. That's really what, what, what the debate comes down to. So how do you get to the point, thinking back to the interview you were referencing, a proponent of NL2K, though he probably wouldn't ascribe to that label, right, but, but still kind of advocating this view, um, saying that rape is not wrong, in this other kingdom, in this other sphere, in this other this other conception, it's not wrong there because God says so, but it's wrong because of you know power dynamics, violence, these sort of things. So you're a Christian, and again, we've got these two separate kingdoms. You're a Christian. You're standing here, and you say within the church house, you know, broad brushstrokes, right? Like God says this is wrong. Ergo, I affirm that. And yet over here, one lives as a citizen of the world or a citizen of the however common kingdom, however we want to phrase that, the non-redemptive kingdom. And here I say it is wrong, but for different reasons. How do you biblically, how, how does that, so that's the end, or not the, exactly the end, but it's it's at least near to the end of the result. How do you get there biblically? Like, where's that argument flowing from that we're conceived of as in these two kingdoms, looking at something and declaring it wrong for two different reasons? Which well, I think I think that that, drive, that question drives us back to the differing interpretations and understanding of the Noahic covenant as one a possible answer to your question. See, I, I happen um, I happen to have studied rather intensely the use that NL2K makes of the Noahic Covenant, and I've read some commentators, Reformed commentators like John Frame and Willem Awenale and others who have analyzed that use of the Noahic Covenant, and I believe that's how you get there to that bifurcated answer that we just spoke of a moment ago. You get there by declaring that the Noahic Covenant is a covenant of common grace where God has established a realm, the world, 
um, where these kinds of arguments and persuasions obtain. Whereas, by contrast, and in opposition to that, you have the church where faith obtains and the Word of God, the Bible obtains, and, and so on and so forth. In other words, it's back at that exegetical point where the turn is made, it seems to me. Okay. So, just pushing in on that a little bit then, um, what what is there in Genesis 9 they're looking at? Uh, I know... I know Alan L's written on this um, quite a bit. Uh, we've referenced others who have uh, who've made quite a bit of hay with with Genesis nine. Um, David Van Drunen, Meredith Klein. Um, th- these are familiar names within this conversation. Um, what are they looking at? Why is why is it lacking? Um, what 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 would drive someone to viewing? Because obviously the Noahic covenant, all the covenants have their unique expressions, right? Um, so there's there's certain features we can look at the Noahic covenant. You have I mean, a family popping off of a boat, uh, you know, post diluvian flood. So, like, it's a unique situation. How is this non-redemptive in that thinking, though? And why is that? Why is that insufficient? Well, it's as far as I understand the argument being made, it's non-redemptive because it is universal. It is made with all creation and all creatures, and therefore the the entire human race is involved in the covenant uh, with Noah, the no, so-called Noahic covenant. And um, it is non-redemptive, therefore. It is creational. It is a covenant with nature. It is a covenant that God makes uh, whose promise is uh, never to destroy the world again with a flood. And he makes that with Noah and in Noah and his family with all of humanity because that's the only humanity left. Um, That's how it is defined and described as non-redemptive. I would push back and I would argue that the Bible presents nothing that is non-redemptive. That in the entire uh, description in the Bible of God's relationship with creation is viewed through the glasses and the lens of redemption. We are never told anything about creation except through the lens, the microphone, uh, the, the audio of redemption. Moreover, I would, I would insist that all of creation, particularly in the New Testament, as it's made clear in Colossians 1, that all of creation is Christocentrically viewed, tinted, uh, Christocentrically understood and presented, because all creation is united in Christ, all creation comes forth from Christ, and all creation is heading to unification, reconciliation in Christ. And therefore, to abstract, and by the way, that is a key term here, abstraction, to abstract the Noahic covenant from that Christocentric Bible motif and that Christocentric impulse is to, um, is to secularize the world by definition. Moreover, <clears throat> I think it's inaccurate to say that the Noahic covenant is universal, whereas the Abrahamic covenant is particularistic. I think it's mistaken because the Abrahamic covenant is as universal as the Noahic covenant in that God said to Abraham, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. I don't know how much more universal one can get or state the matter. In addition to which, I would remind our listeners that Yes, it's true to say that in Noah, as he and his family emerged from the ark, there you have the entire human race. And whatever God says to them, he is saying to the human race. But I would remind you, there you have the entire church. And that what God is saying to Noah and his family, he's saying to the entire church. So that it's very difficult here already to separate right. Noah, fa- Noah and family from, as, as church members, versus Noah and family as members of the human race. Where is God not speaking to the church in Genesis 9, I would ask? I would say he's speaking to the church in the whole chapter. In addition, his promise not to destroy the world or the creation isn't the only promise in Genesis 9. There's another promise that is overlooked, and it is ignored, namely to Japheth, at the end of the chapter in verse 27, where God promises Uh, to Japheth, that he will bless him, and that he will uh, be a god to him. Mm -hmm. So that 
the no the Noahic covenant is part, as O. Palmer Robertson says in his book on the covenants, is part of the covenant of grace. It's an administration of the covenant of grace. And I think there we have a fundamental difference with these contemporary advocates of uh, NL2K, Meredith Klein, whose exegesis is the foundation here, but it's been, uh, it's been refined and it's been developed and it's been applied by David Van Drunen and others to this uh, approach to culture, with, about which now we are uh, complaining Right. Yeah. yeah. It's it's interesting with the with the you're talking about the Christocentric view of scripture because that I mean, it wasn't it wasn't too many years ago I was going through seminary and the Christocentric reading of scripture and specifically a Christo Christotelic as a lot of guys, right. you know, framed it mm-hmm. um was very widely accepted. Con, you know, at, at the same time as you saw this sort of rise in questioning the Noahic covenant, um it's a it's it's certainly along the lines of Continuity, discontinuity discussions, right? So we're, we're talking about whether it's part of the covenant of grace, um, how much continuity there are between the covenants. So for those that, again, I just want to keep emphasizing, like we're discussing in L2K, not all conceptions of two kingdom. So in that conception, then, Noahic covenant is not a part of the covenant of grace, or at least not the same way as the other covenants are. It's called the covenant of common grace. Yeah. So so what 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 is their reckoning then with common grace? Is that just insofar... And I know there's a lot of background there. You've done a lot of study um, on common grace and some of the ways that it's used. But what's what's their conception of common grace then, as opposed to a overarching covenant of grace, it being part of God's redemptive plan, it being a Christotelic covenant? Well, here's here's the problem with um, the presentation of common grace in this iteration of NL2K or Radical Two Kingdom, is that it's it's totally divorced from from Christ, and it's totally divorced from um, from redemptive grace. These are two uh, hermetically sealed compartments, so to speak. They weren't such with Abraham Kuyper, who struggled, in my opinion, he struggled unsuccessfully, but he struggled to place common grace under special grace, under redemptive grace, and in service to it. Um, It remained a persistent criticism of his view of common grace, however, that he never got the job done. He posited Christ as mediator of creation and mediator of redemption. But now we're, we're walking down another speculative trail here. The Bible never speaks of Christ as two mediators, as disjointed, distinct, sealed off from each other, mediatorial activity. Jesus Christ is one in terms of his person, and he is mediator of all and that includes creation and redemption. The problem with, and by the way, I need to recommend that people, and I urgently do this, uh, get a hold of the book Common Grace by J. Dalma, which is published by Lucerna Press, Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary. He has done an exhaustive dissertation level study of the views of common grace held by Abraham Kuyper, Klaus Skilder, and John Calvin. And he has, in my opinion, correctly assessed that Kuyper's view of common grace is exegetically weak, it is theologically speculative, and it it really does not do justice to Calvin's emphasis, and by the way, I must insist as well, the emphasis of the Reformed Confessions, that the the function of common grace is very narrow and simple and straightforward, namely, to render people without excuse. I mean, unfortunately today, people are constructing an entire cultural theology, political theology, on the basis of common grace, as if to say, look at all the good out there we can still make use of. Look at all the good out there we can still harvest and corral and employ in service to Christ. And aren't we, aren't we being redemptive ourselves in so doing? And I, I'm afraid that's not only speculative and misunderstand, misunderstanding, but it ignores the Bible's clear teaching that God's good gifts to people, I don't deny those good gifts, are given to them for the purpose of, or with a function of, rendering them without excuse, because they refuse to give thanks to him as creator, and they exchange the the glory due to the creator 
for their own glory, and they suppress the knowledge of the truth and unrighteousness. And all of those realities are confessed in the Reformed confessions, but they are thoroughly, persistently, and loudly ignored by advocates of NL2K. Mm. So, and I'm, I'm hoping we have time to get into the Reformed confessions, because I know you wanted to read a couple of excerpts from those. Hopefully we can fit those in this one. If we don't, we'll fit it in the second one. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm wondering, so is this is this along the lines of then, kind of circling back to, to the initial part of our conversation, Christ as Redeemer and Christ as non-Redeemer, uh, you know, ruler, let's say, Savior versus ruler. Um, I, I'm asking that because we, we recently heard, um, there's so much that's swirling in this conversation, right? There's, a, there's been recent conversations of theonomy, and Christian nationalism, and post-millennialism, and all these things that are kind of swirling in the cultural zeitgeist right now. But when we look at this specifically, um, I heard a question um, on a panel discussion, and I, it's kind of keyed in in my in my thinking because the question was in reference to Psalm two, uh, where it says, um, you know, to the kings of the earth, kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Um, I I take that as a universal call to the the kings and rulers of this world to bow the knee to Christ as king. The question was, are they bowing the knee to Christ as king, or are they bowing the knee to Christ as Lord? Essentially, uh, in what way, or in in my understanding of the question, it was in what sphere, what kingdom are they bowing this knee? You mentioned redemptive kingdom versus non-redemptive kingdom. I'm oh, wondering if that plays into this conversation. Oh, um, yeah. The fact that God would have a redemptive kingdom in which Christ is ruling as redeemer and a non-redemptive kingdom in which he is ruling as something else than redeemer. Are you, are you following? Yeah, I think thing? so. I think so. I mean, I, in that non-so-called, and that's not my term, that is a non-redemptive kingdom. It's their term. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that, that their God rules uh, by virtue of his power and authority as creator, not redeemers, but as creator. And that Jesus, to the extent that Jesus does rule in that kingdom, he does so as second person of the Trinity, as creator, as Christos Asarkos, that is Christ who is not in the flesh. Christos en sarkos, Christ in the flesh, refers, of course, to Christmas and the Incarnation and refers to who Christ is for the church and for the redeemed and for uh, the redemptive kingdom. Again, we have a bifurcation here. We have a Christological problem here is what we have. Mm. But with reference to Psalm 2, I think that the exhortation there is for for all people, but all potentates, all Uh, kings and rulers to acknowledge that their authority comes from God. Now, you say, well, they they can't or won't do that unless they're regenerated, and thereby they become members of the church, supposedly. Well, I don't don't know that that's in Psalm 2. I think Psalm 2 is simply saying to all creatures, like like Cyrus and, and, and other kings of foreign empires, that they are to bend the knee. Uh, to to God as the one who is sovereign of the world. The psalmists persistently call upon all nations to praise the Lord. And the, in Psalm 2, all rulers to kiss the son lest he be angry. Right. Um, and that simply is, in my opinion, a summons to acknowledge the jurisdiction of God over over all kingdoms. Over that by kingdoms, I mean here all nations, yeah. over all uh, principalities, all powers, and so yeah. Um, so this this has been helpful. Um, and I'm I, if somebody's watching this, they're new to the conversation. I wanted to keep this initial episode a little bit brief, mm-hmm. so I'm thinking we might wrap this one up soon. Um, and th- this leads into, in my mind, the Great Commission conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I'm what I'm what I'm going to suggest is um, for our next installment. Lead in with the confessions, hear from the confessions a bit, um, the words and the, the the verbiage that they use concerning this matter, and then walk into the Great Commission, because I think this directly impacts that conversation. That's been something you and I have been talking about for quite some time. Um, it's been something that, that is quite quickly dismissed. Um, but what would any any closing thoughts on sort of a general conception? Because again, if you're if you're new to this conversation, um, or even if you're even if you're in the conversation like me and struggling to keep your head above the water, this can be a lot to kind of drink in. You're thinking to Calvin, to Turretin, to different um, different reformers, and wondering how they how they sussed out these ideas. 
but any any kind of closing ideas or thoughts that might help people kind of frame the conversation and where where the where the people are standing. Yeah, one of my one of my concerns is that in terms of this conversation that we're having, some people see that there are only believe that there are only two possible positions to hold. One is either NL2K, Radical Two Kingdom, a la what's called the Escondido School, or one is a theonomic, theocratic Christian Reconstructionist insisting that um, only Christians hold office in the government and only only Christians make the laws, and et cetera, et cetera. Right. You're either fully with Meredith Klein or you were over here with Gary North or that's right. Dooney. Or, that's or, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's not true. I think that's not true at all. And I think that we, what we need to do is we need to get back to what I would argue is the historic position of uh, the Christian church. And that's why I, I hope to be sharing some things from the Reformed Confessions to identify that historic position. Yeah. But um, the historic position falls on neither side. But it, in my opinion, it goes between both of them. So keeping the nuance and keeping in balance um, because, you see, <laughs> let me go back to this point. The Reformation, as you know, fought against two fronts. The one front was the Roman Catholic Church with regard to its excesses and its infidelities and its inadequacies and so on. But another equally important front against which the Reformation fought was that of Anabaptism. And I think people forget that. In fact, one could say, one might say, Anabaptism has won the day. But we need to identify those opponents of the Reformation in order properly to understand the Reformation. And then I think that same kind of exercise is required today, that we properly identify the heritage of the Reformation, which then is in answer to both these houses and say neither of these houses is what we wish to live in. All right. So. All right. Good. Okay. So we'll wrap up there. Um, Dr. Klosterman, again, thank you for joining me today. We'll we'll try to put links on there, especially to the books that you're going to be referencing, um, any of the articles that are pertinent. We'll try to provide links for that. But um, installment number two, we're going to jump into the confessions. We're going to jump into the Great Commission, walk through, walk through uh, sure. some of those themes. So thank you for joining me again today, sir. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. This concludes episode one of this three-part series examining natural law and two-kingdom theology. We encourage you to uh, like and subscribe to Eschatology Matters to keep up with our content. And please tune back in and check out episodes two and three of this ongoing series. Seated here at my right hand, the Lord to my Lord did command. Say. The Lord.